Disclaimer. Please check your playback settings. Ensure you are listening to this podcast at normal speed. Unless you want us to sound drunk. Then play at half speed. Thank you. We present to you, Dark Lord, this as an offering. Bali Jaroge. Bali Manti Kalima. We humbly request that you send a demon to help us. Isemir put mein racho. Mukti Dagi Kalima. We offer the heart of our companion, Dan, as our eternal offering. Yes, we offer... Wait, what? Hear that guy on the chopping block? Yeah, that's me. And you're wondering how I got into this situation, aren't you? Well, it all started about two weeks ago. Ugh, God damn it, we're getting pulled over. Well, Dan, that's what happens when you go 75 in a 30. You saw the old lady. She made eye contact. She clearly wanted to race. I have to establish dominance. She was in a rascal. You're in a Ford Taurus. What dominance? Exactly. Left her in our dust. Dude, the cop's coming. Yeah, he's walking real slow, too. Oh, jeez, this guy's gonna give me a ticket. I can just feel it. I'm getting a ticket. Oh, God. Okay, I'm not one to insult people based on their physical appearance, but that is one ugly cop. Josh, don't start. We don't really have a great track record with the police, and I really don't want to... Ugh, that is an ugly motherfucker. Shut up, shut up, shut up. Look, we can't afford me getting a ticket, especially on our way to work. Hello, officer. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh god! Oh god! Oh god! Hello, nurse! Oh god! Good god! Good god! Good god! Not again! Hear that guy in the backseat? Yeah, that poor fool being dragged along for the ride is me. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation, huh? Well, you see, it all started about two weeks ago. Josh? What are you looking at? Oh, this thing? Oh, dude, this is the Book of the Dead. You know, the one that Dan used when we played that baseball game? Oh, yeah! Yeah, those were good times. Yeah. He summoned demons, opened up Where the... Where did you find uh, that? Oh. Like, we really might want to get rid of it. Okay. The thing, it gave me some really odd, um dreams yeah sure okay no i mean like really bad dreams where like i killed a bunch of people it felt real it felt scary real yeah ooh, 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 oh my god this one looks like a zombie mummy thing what's it what's it say around there um no i can read this yeah i took like half a semester on egyptology so i'm the expert um <clears throat> amun ra amun de sui oa simo What's happening? What? Where'd the wind come from? We're in a basement. Oh my god, Josh, your skin! It's glowing red! And your eyes! They're on fire! Let me get my camera! You hear that guy being possessed by a demon? Yeah, that's me. And you're probably wondering how I got into this situation. Well... It all started about- Yo, 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 whoa, 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 what do you think you're doing? This is my flashback. Don't inception this on me. It's my flashback, actually. I don't even know how the hell you guys are doing this. What, so I don't get a flashback? This is bullshit. No, this is my turn for the flashback. Dan had a flashback. You already had a flashback. Oh, this is my flashback. Yeah, yeah, let's watch a movie, guys. Are you troubled by a strange Sylvester Stallone and Demolition Man in the middle of the night? Do you experience feelings of Grandel Bush and Maniac Cop 3 in your basement? Or Robert Davi in License to Kill in your attic? Have you or your family ever seen a spook, Spectre, or Timothy Dalton in The Rocketeer? If you've ever followed Joe Polito into The Crow, then don't wait another minute. Pick up the phone and call the professionals. Ernie Hudson in Ghostbusters Afterlife. We're ready to believe you. This is it. The final chapter of Season 2 of The Fire Pit. The Marshmallow Man March to the Afterlife. Step on through to the other side at firepitpodcast.com as Dan, Tom, and Josh take you towards the podcast's final and inevitable resting place. Ghostbusters Afterlife. It spooks, 
specters, ghosts, and it's here every Tuesday at the Fire Pit. We're ready to believe you. Good evening, bots and listeners, and welcome back to the Fire Pit. I'm Josh, British name Reginald, and uh, I hope you guys are all ready for another exciting movie on our Marshmallow Man March into the Afterlife. Because last week, we barely got out of a future with no sex, no cussing, and nothing to eat but Taco Bell. So we're just now recovering from that. At least our toilets are. So I'm curious to see what's in store for this week. But as per our rules, we've taken an actor or an actress from our last film and moved them on over to this one. Now, to give us an idea of what we're watching and who we're watching, I am going to go ahead and uh, summon Dan. Thank you, Josh. Dan here, British name Nigel. And uh, last week, we followed old Sly Stallone out of Rocky and into Demolition Man. And in that film, in a small role at the very beginning was one Grand L. Bush, Agent Johnson in Die Hard. One of them, anyways. And uh, that's who we'll be following to tonight's cinematic masterpiece. Sit your ass down, Avengers Endgame. It's Maniac Cop 3. B-movie cult classic. So what kind are we getting tonight? Are we going to get a Flash Gordon cult classic or a Thing cult classic? Who knows? But to give us a rundown of the film and maybe talk some of the production, Tom. Thank you, Nigel. Thompson here, American name Tom. And as mentioned, tonight we are watching Maniac Cop 3, Badge of Silence. Welcome Robert Zadar of Tango and Cash and Robert Davi of Predator 2 to the 2 Pete category. I hate that you give me that line you every time. shouldn't have said it there is at least a minimum of three instances prior to us scripting it for you where you've said to pete you've been corrected on at least three of those but then i discovered tom hasn't have a cat doesn't have a catchphrase he needs one so and it's to pete some were born great some achieve greatness some call repeats to pete's and this movie also stars the aforementioned Grand L. Bush, Jackie Earl Haley, and Paul Gleason. Rorschach's in this? Nice. Yes, yes. Well, this is earlier career Jackie Earl Haley. So um, if it was a steady paycheck, Jackie Earl Haley. But this movie, Maniac Cop 3, was released, air quotes released, on July 7th, 1993. It has a running time of 85 minutes, a budget of, yes, and a box office of, uh, I'm sure Josh will help me on that one. In terms of Rotten Tomatoes, no critics dared to touch this, but it does have an audience score of, dramatic pause, 16%. And an IMDb of 5 out of 10. Is this officially the lowest ranked movie we've seen on this podcast? Uh, It might be. The audience score is only like what? What did I say? 16% in 16, the script? 16, yeah. 16%. Uh, it might be, yeah. I think it's the lowest one we've ever done. I can't, I'm hard pressed to think of anything lower than that. And what doesn't get much lower than this is the production of Maniac Cop 3, Badge of Silence. Tagline, they thought the terror had been terminated, but they were wrong. Summary, a priest practicing the voodoo arts resurrects Matt Cordell, played by Robert Starr, who takes his badge and comes back from the dead to do his bidding. Now, is it a like a Catholic priest that's practicing voodoo, or is it like a voodoo priest? I'm sure we're going to find out. But this is, unsurprisingly, the third in the Maniac Cop series, inspired by, well, the first two maniac cops why they need they why they thought they needed to make three of these films uh maybe dan will have some details in his trivia as near as i can tell this is a schlock film made by schlock people for the sake of schlock i mean the only people who helped make this film i'm guessing either had a fondness for the original or just needed a paycheck because just everything about this is 
is it's a stinker from top to bottom. For what none of the producers, WK Border, Michael Leahy, or Joel Soyson were part of the original Bruce Campbell movie, but they have had their hands in almost exclusively schlock titles such as Dracula 2000, Phantoms, and American Pie, The Naked Mile. So them producing a movie like this isn't really out of character, but not counting the writer and director, only about two or three people returned from the original cast. Again, as noted before, we got Robert Zadar who is playing the titular Maniac Cop, who has started such classics like Samurai Cop and Silent Fury. So of course he comes back for this one. I guess Tango and Cash, he decided, you know, I've, I've hit my peak. I can just coast. Well, honestly, I think I read it. I think in the produ- my production notes too with, um, or my trivia with the Samurai Cop was that um, he was only supposed to be in that opening scene in not Samurai Cop. We haven't done that movie. We will never do that movie. Tango and Cash. He was only in the opening scene for Tango and Cash, but Stallone With really that. liked him. Yeah, Stallone really liked him, so they added the fight scene that he's in the prison. Cause really? Robert, yeah, yeah. Robert Zadar gets a fight scene with um, Stallone as when they're escaping the prison because Stallone really liked him when they were filming the opening. No kidding. Well, likable guy, Robert Zadar. I mean, with a chin like that, how could you not like him? Yeah. Um, the other two returning actors for this film are Matt Colm and Frank Pesh. They're the two that have had the steadiest work in big budget Hollywood films. Uh, you might recognize them as the uncredited guard in Iron Man 2, the uncredited club goon in John Wick, the bartender in Top Gun, and the doorman in Creed, respectively. We got some A-listers here, guys. I know guys. who that guy is. <laughs> hey, it's that one guy. Yeah, he did that did that movie with those people in that thing. Yes. All of them are in this movie. Also, honorable mention goes out to a cameo by Ted Raimi, but he's oh he always does cameos in cheesy horror films like Midnight Meat Train and Wishmaster. So it's par for the course. Yeah, it's his thing. Yes. And rounding out everything are the director William Lustig and the writer Larry Cohen. Uh, both of them are the returnees for from the original movies. Uh, again, if, if it's making money, why stop beating the dead horse? Um, Cohen has some renown here. Um, tell me if you'd like watching any work from this guy. He's done movies such as It's Alive and Women of San Quentin. Um, Sounds like movies we need to get to. Right. Um, And as for the director, William Lustig, tell me if you'd like to watch some of these films. Actually, I I didn't write down any of his films. Um, Most of his early career was porn. (laughs) Yeah. And then he moved on up to these ones. Like I said... This is schlock all the way down, guys. Are we excited or what? Honestly, we've never done a, well, Flash Gordon. And I'm, I'm trying to think of some others on our list. We, I, don't, I can't think, I don't think we've ever done like a true B schlock movie. Because you got to remember like Flash Gordon was actually made with pr- high, well, at the time they thought high production values and Star Wars in mind. And then you're like, no, no. <laughs> this, yeah, this is, I think this is our first basically made for streaming services well not streaming at the time but this was made for hbo in 1993 so yes. it never had a theatrical release which kind of blurs or it, it borders the rules of what we pick but at the same time there's no hard rules yeah yeah now we know what went into making this film so josh i think now this is a just a natural segue into the I guess for this one, air quotes, box office. So what is the box office for this movie that never made it to the box office? Well, it was on the home box office, the HBOs, and I have no financial information for this movie whatsoever. (laughs) I tried to find it. There's none. It's funny. It's like I found a web page. It's called The Numbers. It's kind of my secondary website I go to to check a box office info. Mm -hmm. And there's a page for Maniac Cop 3. So I click on it and it's blank. It was such a high budgeted film that they couldn't even measure it clearly. Yes. So, um, but I did want to touch on a little bit on the ratings for this movie. You talked about like it's our lowest rated movie, and I want to say you're half correct. I believe, and I 
only checking a handful of films that we've gone through, but it is. I think it's the lowest rated audience score we've ever uh, watched, but it's not the lowest rated. And obviously we're comparing audience score with the critic score, but it's not the lowest rated movie that we've watched on this podcast. It's tied with the art of war at 16%. Oh, do you guys, okay. oh boy. Oof. Yeah. Do you guys care to take a guess which movie we've watched that's rated lower than 16%? On this podcast? On this podcast. This is a meta quiz. Oh, shoot. Oh, I, I am, what, was it uh, Pathfinder? Tom, what do you think? I, I have to go Pathfinder. My brain wanted to forget that movie. So it's either Pathfinder or Dead Calm. But I'm going to go with Pathfinder. It's Pathfinder. Pathfinder got a 10% critic score. 36% oh, that felt audience like score. a 10% movie. Yes. Yes. Considering we watched it almost a year and a half ago and we're still talking about it. But yes, Pathfinder is the lowest rated film we've watched on this podcast. But I think that this movie is going to be the lowest rated audience score. I'll have to go through and investigate a little bit more. But Pathfinder got a 36%. But that's 50,000 plus ratings. Whereas Maniac Cop 3 has a few less. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. This is, uh, yeah, it's only got a thousand plus ratings at 16%. So let's, let's see if we can get more ratings on there for, for the fire pit. But uh, shame we're not doing any of the quiz section anymore. <laughs> I'd love to hear some thoughts about this one. <laughs> yeah, that's that would be interesting. But Maniac Cop, the first one was actually released in box office. It was released in 50 theaters for one weekend. It one had a budget of, of one weekend, like three days. And it managed to pull in $671,000. Hey, compared to some other films that were released of about the same amount it's, during the pandemic or early, yeah, during the pandemic, that's that's good numbers. Yeah, but I mean, it made more than Slipstream. It did make more than Slipstream. It made more than Slipstream. But uh, like I said, Maniac Cop 2 and 3 were all just basically made for HBO and released on HBO. But it's interesting their ratings. Maniac Cop 2 is actually received better than Maniac Cop 1. And Maniac Cop 3 is actually considered the worst in the series. I think you're just judging which shit you liked the least during a week <laughs> of bowel movements. But, which one's the Quiznos shit and which one's the Taco Bell shit? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, but like Maniac Cop 1 got a 6 out of 10 on IMDb. Maniac Cop 2 got a 5.9 out of 10. And Maniac Cop 3 got a 5 out of 10. Incremental steps. So to also put this into perspective, this movie was released in 1993. Do you know what other movie was released in 1993 that we watched last week? Demolition Man? Yes. Oh, God. Same year as other movies like Jurassic Park, The Fugitive, The Firm, Mrs. Doubtfire, Aladdin, Cliffhanger, A Few Good Men, Free Willy, a podcast favorite, Groundhog Day. Yeah, so, sir, uh, change of plan. We're going to have this movie go on HBO. Yeah, yeah. Like, I don't think we're going to make this one up. Yeah, it's, it's probably going to be better than Tom Cool, because this one actually got released. Is that necessarily going to be a good thing? Don't know. Um, I, I did not want to tell you guys that we could have watched Loaded Weapon 1 because I, I really wanted to watch this one. <laughs> really hope J Josh is happy not getting a list for another six weeks because uh, it's going to happen. I'm okay with that. That means I, I'm, I'll get the next one. No, no. twelve. <laughs> 18. You know, I, I, I don't want to hear it, Tom. I put that up there and I put it up for your consideration. Um, if you guys would have been manically against it, see what I did there. I had a couple other movies, but Tom. Your reaction was very positive. Like, yep, that's the movie we're watching. So that's why we're watching Maniac Cop 3. It's true. I am culpable here. I am an accessory to murder. Yes, but yeah, I'm, I'm rambling now. Dan, I want to hear some trivia for this movie. Yeah, I want to too. <laughs> there's not much. Uh, really, there's not. Uh, the film actually had some troubled production. Surprise, surprise. Director William Lustig's rough cut came in at only 51 minutes. He refused to shoot the additional scenes the producers wanted and quit the project. Um, then the balance of the picture was directed by co-producer Joel Soisson. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Prior to Blue Underground's DVD and Blu-ray release of the movie in 2013, Lustig was the film's only credited director. However, the Blue Underground version is credited to the Director's Guild of America pseudonym Alan Smithy. Oh, uh, yeah. Nice little bit of extra, like meta, or not meta, but yeah, you know, Hollywood trivia right there. Yeah. yeah. Who was that guy? 
A- Alan Smithy is a pseudonym that directors use when they uh, a movie comes out that they're either A, not proud of, B, walked away from and didn't really complete, or C, all of the above. Like, it just oh, Alan okay. Smithy is like, you know, I'm not touching this movie. I don't want my name attached to it. So, so basically, the know. guy that got to direct the reshoots is like, I don't want my name yeah. on this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. As with the preceding film, Matt Cordell, Robert Zadar, speaks only once. So he only has like one or two lines in the whole film. And considering his dialogue in um, uh, Tango, Tango and Cash, Cash, yeah, it's probably for the best, too. <laughs> yeah, that man was built to be looked at, not to speak. R.I.P. Yes, yeah, he is uh, actually uh, past this plane of existence. He passed away March 30th of 2015. Aw, man, I know a dog on him, but, you know, aw. Angels are doing chin-ups on his uh, chin in heaven. I made that joke during Tango and Cash. He does have a big chin. Um, this uh, movie does have three diehard alumni, uh, Robert Davey, Paul Gleason, and uh, our connector, um, uh, that guy who did the connecting. Dude face. Yeah, no. Grand, Grand L. Bush. Gr- yeah, Grand L. Bush. Grand L. Bush and uh, Robert Davi are the two Agent Johnsons that are on the helicopter talking about how they're going to kill like 60% of the hostages with this explosion. And they're all like, oh, I can live with those numbers. But then <laughs> Bruce Willis saves all the hostages and blows up the roof and it kills Agent Johnson and Johnson. So I'm, best- I'm OK with those odds. Yeah, best laid plans. And uh, Paul Gleason is the uh, angry chief in Die Hard, the one that's uh, telling... Al, that they don't even know if Bruce Willis isn't one of the terrorists and all that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. For whatever reason, my brain was thinking Jackie Gleason from the Honeymooners. I was thinking the chief from Die Hard 2. That is Dennis France. Yeah. And then the only other bit of trivia I have in this is that the movie is supposed to be set in New York. However, it was clearly filmed in Los Angeles. The dead giveaway is there's no palm trees in New York City. But they still try to market it like New York. Yes, and the movie is supposed to take place in New York, and they emphasize that it's from New York, and they keep saying NYPD and things like that, except the movie is clearly in Los Angeles. Um, even the establishing shots are Los Angeles, like there's no palm trees in New York City. This is a B-movie. Yeah. We are we are, in for, we are going to see B-movie tropes. We are going to see long camera shots that should have been cut 10 seconds prior. We're going to see bad establishing shots. We're going to see atrocious dialogue and or a- ADR. Honestly, I can't wait. Well, oh, so I I, have... Are you segueing into expectations now, Dan? <laughs> I'm out of trivia. We're going to have to. Actually, I do have one little extra bit of trivia that I found when I was looking things up. Um, if you don't mind me adding a little bit to you, Nigel. Sure. So I guess, um, and I'm going off the top of my head because I didn't write it down, but this movie was originally written to have a black actor as a lead. And all of the dialogue and a lot of the plot beats were written with that in mind. And then, for whatever reason, because I didn't write it down, they decided to not do that. Yeah, here it is. I've got it right in um, it's in uh, Wikipedia. The original script featured a black detective investigating the series of murders, uh, but the Japanese producers did not want a black lead. So, um... Their script didn't make any sense anymore. So they just had to rewrite it on the fly and try to make it work with improv. And much like um, Nithix, it was a bit of a chop shop job. And so that's probably going to add to our watch. Oh, man, we are going to be in for a treat tonight, guys. Yeah. Oh, my God. Get to my expectations. I can't wait to go. <laughs> well, you are, you're the first one up, Josh. So by all means... Tell us what you're expecting about this uh, gem that you've given us right before the holiday season. Oh, my God. I am so looking forward to this episode. (laughs) Yes, you are. When I saw this movie on there, I'm like, Maniac Cop 3. I've never I've seen it a couple of times pop up, but I never went with it. I went and I watched the trailer and I was sold about 40 seconds into it. And then I decided I didn't want to do it about 46 seconds into it. And then I was sold again at about a minute and 10. But um, yeah, this movie looks absolutely B-level schlock. And it looks at, like pro- it's easily going to be probably the worst movie we've seen. But I am seriously hoping that it is a Tango and Cash. Oh, I don't think it's going to be a Tango and Cash. I don't either. I really don't either. 
like it's one of those things. It's like sometimes people watch bad movies that they'll really enjoy, and I'm hoping to get that out of this. I don't think that's going to happen. These are expectations. These aren't assumptions. So I'm expecting a absolute shit film, but I'm wanting a fun film that is so bad it's good. Yeah, that's that's really all I've got for that. This it's an hour. It's not even an hour and a half. It's 85 minutes long, and yeah, this is going to be great. Like it's going to be great. This is going to be an awesome episode, and either we're going to absolutely fall in love with this movie, or the audience is going to absolutely fall in love with us suffering. So I'm going to go with. Yeah. I think it's going to be B. Yeah, Vegas odds are pretty strong on that one. Yes. So, Nigel, what about you? Um, I've seen parts of Maniac Cop 1, so I think this is going to be worse than those parts of Maniac Cop 1. When they say that the series peaked at number two, and I'm like, oh, God. Yeah, I think this is going to be just total B-movie schlock that we've really never done on this podcast before. We've done B-movies or cult classics before, but nothing with this bad of a production everyone involved had to have known this was going to be a shit film i'm not looking forward to watching the movie but i'm looking forward to making this episode <laughs> very yeah, masochistic way of looking at it yeah i you know? this is one of those things that the audience is going to love listening to us suffer and unfortunately they're going to eventually demand that we do maniac cops one and two so thank you josh <laughs> you're welcome yeah this uh yeah i had a thought but i lost it well hopefully you get it back by the time tom gets done with his expectations tom what are yours i'm expecting that we're going to fire josh after this and <laughs> uh, uh be on the market for a third so put your resumes in you too can be the third member of the fire pit podcast because josh is going to be banned my God, Josh, why do you want us to suffer? Why? This is not the first time you tried to put us through the ringer here. Oh, God, this looks bad. I haven't even seen the trailer. I just actually no, I did see a bit of the trailer and it just looks. There's a YouTube channel called Best of the Worst where they specialize in watching just the B. Yes, of B movies that go straight to DVD slash VHS. I'm surprised this one hasn't been on their show. It just looks like it should be. And yet here we are watching it and finding out for everyone else just how bad it is. The fact that the writer could not even be bothered to do the necessary rewrites. It's going to be another Nighthawks. Only instead of editing, you know, in Nighthawks, like they, in order to get an R rating, they had to cut out everything worthwhile in that movie. I feel we're going to get a lot of that in just story flow. It's not going to be an easy watch. It's not going to be a fun watch. It's going to be a torture watch. But my God. You couldn't have paid me to watch this film. I didn't even finish the first one, and that one was bad. That was just bad. So this it's going to get worse. And now we're into the merge section, and I'm just going to start. Why, Josh? Why do you hate your co-hosts? What have we done to you? Okay, you want to know what you've done to me? Um, Let's see. Deadcom, Swashbuckler, The Greatest, Wimbledon, and you're still here? So I'm not afraid for my job. Yeah, he's got you there, Tom. Yeah, I uh, did not expect a good film, but I think that this is going to be a fun episode. Oh, yeah, um, this will be a great episode. This is going to be another Swashbuckler. Oh, guaranteed. I hope better than that. Swashbuckler was bad in an incompetent way, and that's what's frustrating about those kind of films. Like when you have quality actors and quality directors and a high budget, and they still produce... <laughs> Yes, we needed to do a bad film. And honestly, I, I, I've had a couple bad films on my list before, but I haven't had like an art of war. So, <laughs> <laughs> man, Josh is just passing the buck around, Nigel. <laughs> I needed Michael Bean. 
<laughs> yeah, you said you had a better film than this, Josh, and you still went with this film. Yeah, we can, no, no, we no, no, no. Watching Loaded no, no. Weapon One tonight, and you've purposely kept that away from us. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a terrible movie, and we're probably going to hate ourselves watching it. But I'm going to love listening to the episode when it cut, when you give me the proof for it. <laughs> this is rock gut tequila we're about to try, but it is. You're right. We've had a lot of films that were bad but they weren't supposed to be bad someone put money and effort into those even slipstream was a a bad film but you could tell they really really wanted to make that a good film yeah despite everything if i can come out of this movie enjoying it like i enjoyed hard ticket to hawaii i'll be happy yeah and honestly as bad as um Nighthawks was, I would still want to see the original cut of that film. Yes. Yes. Because they talk about how like they, they it was way more violent, way more, you know, bloody, and more emphasis on the bad things the terrorist guy Rutger Howard was doing instead mm -hmm. of what we got, which was them in the classroom. That was fun. <laughs> but, repeating um, the same three scenes with slightly different dialogue and slightly yeah. different camera angles. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was an experience. Or a dead calm where it's just like Sam Neill in the basement of a ship just bilge pumping and looking emotionlessly at another TV showing a much better scene that we don't get to see. <laughs> yeah. Gods, man. Those were some We've seen some though. bad movies on this podcast. Oh, yeah. We've, I mean, look, I got through Pathfinder. Barely. <laughs> we were thinking and talking about much better better films that yeah. we could be watching yeah, thank, thank god the mcu is a thing because i had something to talk about during the film yeah. yeah yeah well i look forward to this movie being in that echelon of terrible movies that we have watched mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so yeah and will it knock the, some of our worst films out of their worst film category will it redeem art of war in our eyes nothing's going to ever redeem no art no. of war there that's Never impossible been. To do that. And honestly, I still don't think Art of War is not the worst one we've ever watched. That, to me, is still Pathfinder. But I agree. I agree. Um, Agreed. Uh, I honestly think this one's got – if any movie's got a chance to knock Pathfinder off its pedestal? <laughs> toilet. Yeah, it's toilet. Uh, then it would be this one. So mm -hmm. yeah. I uh, – The good I, news is this one's only 85 minutes. Oh, thank God. Yes. Blessed. Thank you, direct to VHS HBO films for being short. I'm scared, guys. I'm, I'm scared, scared too. All right. Well, since now we know what we've thought about the movie, would you guys like to know about what other people have thought about this movie? Ooh, no. No. Wow. No. Oh, yes. No, yes, please. No. no. All right. Well, since Dan didn't make the quiz last week and we didn't have a quiz last week, I took it upon myself to write the quiz this week. No. So, Yay! Dan. Dan, you get to go first this time. So um, play the music. Welcome back to another arresting episode of the Fire Pit. I am, as always, your interspersal host, editor, and undead detective, Tom. Breaker 1-9, Breaker 1-9, I am in hot pursuit of a vampire heading down Stroker and Shelly. Suspect is driving a coffin strapped to a 1964 drag car powered by a 289 slash 350 horsepower V8 engine requesting air support and garlic stacked. Stand by! And thank you for pursuing us through another episode here at the Fire Pit. We're dealing with rising dead and rising crime rates as we continue the Marshmallow Man march into the afterlife. But thankfully we have an undead deputy to help us secure the crime scene and get us to the station of Ghostbusters Afterlife. And speaking of getting to places, let's see how the team is getting out of their latest crime scene. Will we sacrifice this soul? Shh, 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 shh. We gotta do this. Dan put a leash on him. Dash delivery. We got your order here. It's about time you showed up. Yeah. <sighs> oh, what happened to you three? <sighs> the usual. Traffic. Brimstone. Dead rising from the grave. Where have you been this past week, man? A better question. Where's my Chipotle? It burns in the eternal flames of the Tartarus. Shut up! 
Hey, what's wrong with your friend over there? Dan? He's fine. He's just got that long form possession by a demon. It's it's fine. He, he's, he's fine. Partially possessed. He's partially possessed. Complete the ritual. Stab this meat bag in the heart. Submit to my command. Shut up. Shut up. Shut up. Sorry about that. So where's my food? Uh, we lost it. Yeah, somebody opened the gates to hell and unleashed a demonic legion. And whoever said you had to fight fire with fire never tried to unleash a demon to fight a demon. I will scorch this earth and send him back to hell, then sit upon my throne triumphant. <laughs> Sorry about him, me, whatever. Oh shit, dude, it's the cop guy again. Jesus! <laughs> yeah, what an idiot. He's pulled us over three times and he didn't even recognize the car. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I landed in a rose bush. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yeah, that is pretty funny. Oh, uh, last time, where's my food? No idea, but here, we got your quiz notes. <laughs> You're fired. God, again. Like the, it's the fourth one in a row. Yeah. How could he even fire us? He's a customer. I don't know. But hey, on to our next order. We got like four more. I mean, if we leave now, we won't be late. Let's do it. Wait, whose flashback is this? What the hell are you talking about? This isn't a flashback. Yeah, it is. See, there's that old lady. The one you raced earlier. Oh, yeah. Wait, if this is a flashback, then why hasn't there been a... Do you see that magnificent beast strapped to the pathetic meat bag? The one who's stuck listening to these idiots argue about whether or not this is a flashback? Yeah, that is me. You're probably wondering how I got here. Well, it all started. Oh, I get it now. Okay, it's demon me. That explains it. But why is there a Quiznos reference in 2021? The joke only works if you don't overthink it. So wait, what's actually happening right now? Oh! The zombie cop is about to attack you, of course. So is this a flashback to the things that have already happened? Or a flash forward to things that haven't happened yet? Or a flash back forward to things that are going to be happening? I'm sure the stinger will clear everything up. But if you want to clear things up about some past movies we watched, or if you want to make it clear to some potential customers that you have amazing products to sell, or if you want to make it clean and clear to everyone out there how awesome you think we are, or someone else might be, then feel free to email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. That's curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Just be sure to put Fire Pit in the subject line as well as a reason for your email, whether it's to commission an ad, request a shout out, make a personal inquiry, or whatever else is getting your ghost, and flute it our way. From there, we'll read it, conduct a voodoo ritual to resurrect it from the grave, send it off to do our mysterious and sometimes foreboding bidding, and never respond. Mysterious bidding isn't mysterious if you tell everyone what it is. But that email again is curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. Capital C, capital C, capital E, capital I, at gmail.com. Holy shit! Breaker 1-9, suspect is now engaged in a wolfman and a mummy. We now have a full monster squad scenario. Forget backup, we need Frankenstein stat! Looks like I'm going to be dancing this monster mash for a while, so I'll let you get back to the episode. Thank you all for listening, and as always, good luck. Oh great, and now there's a creature from the Black Lagoon. I'm getting too undead for this shit. And now to check on the team to see how they're enjoying their movie. Did you download all the Maniac Cops, Josh? I did. Why do you do this to yourself, Josh? I was originally going to try to watch the first two before we came up here. I just never got in time to do it.
You don't need to hurt yourself for this podcast. Do we need an intervention? Kali Ma. Ba weep, grana weep, mini bomb. Please forgive whatever sins he may have committed through human weakness. Cut to cop pulling an, a freaking Terminator through a whole police station. This is what we call a uh, flashback. It's, look at all that weakness there. Like, and a needless shot of a feather. Yeah. Need, oh, this like, is a Coen brother film? Uh, let's not make the same mistake Bill Murray made. <laughs> <laughs> I love that he has no ear covering. He's got to be deaf. So what's with the no headgear? I love the sound of gunfire. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, yeah, but you're in an enclosed place, so... I mean, if you're shooting out in a field, you might not need it, but, uh... Sir, put it on. At least the film is aware of it. Just because you're aware that you're doing a dumb thing isn't an excuse for doing a dumb thing. Got a four-alarm fire in Brooklyn. Come on, the networks won't even consider it unless there's at least three confirmed dead. I hate these guys, by the way. I hope they die. You might get your wish. I think I'm going to. Pray to the news guys, the gram, it's just one good misfortune. Pray to the media gods. For their misfortune. Where did the movie go? <laughs> okay, okay, what if what if this entire movie is called Maniac Cop 3, but that's the only way that this dude could get this movie made? But he wrote this entire other procedural cop drama, and like all the movie is and related to Maniac Cop 3 is just the Maniac Cop walking around. Yeah. Maniac Cop 3, lost in New York. <laughs> I mean, like, this entire other movie happens, but like they needed the title, so they had to include the maniac cop somehow. But he has no effect on the main plot. <laughs> I mean, we're twenty minutes in, and he's done nothing but walk around and miss everything going on. I think you might be right, Josh. No, no, we're not just twenty minutes in. We're one sixth of the way through the movie. So tell me, Detective McKinney, how do you deal with pain? Chocolate, chocolate, and ice cream works every time. And the Oscar goes to... Officer Kate Sullivan is seen here shooting both hostage and suspect for this young pharmacist. The last prescription she filled was the bitter pill of fate. I love Hollywood news stories. I've never heard a news reporter, even local news, say shit like that. But in Hollywood, they always say these really bad lines. Yeah. Hashtag fake news. Nice. At least he died with a smile on his face. At least he died with a smile on his face. <laughs> oh my god! Ah, this script writes itself! <laughs> so so it's uh, confirmed Tom speaks like a B-level movie actor. <laughs> How many shots does that six shooter have? 18. 18. <laughs> 18. It's divisible by six. I am a oh you gone now back to razor of the dead. Does that happen to include desecration of corpses and stuffing them with dead chickens? Hey, I don't judge what you do on a Saturday. This is the one where Bruce Willis was all like, I don't want to be in this movie. This one? He was in the first two. You mean Bruce Campbell? Bruce Campbell. Did I say Willis? Damn, Josh. You did. No, Bruce Willis in 93 wouldn't be in these types of movies. Bruce Willis in 2021 would. He's probably in the reboot. Seriously, this movie is better than the most recent Bruce Willis movie I've seen. Low bar. Why don't you just move aside and he will kick the door down? He clearly you know, has a purpose. This movie could be called Maniac Cop 3. Just wait a minute. The problems will resolve themselves. Because... Yes. Like, half this plot wouldn't have happened if someone would have just waited ten minutes. Roll credits. Are you gonna please roll credits? roll credits. Please. Please. We've gone through enough. We've got damn it. ten minutes left. Damn it. God damn it. It's the hobbits in the Shire. Terminator 2. Highway scene. Be damned. How is he still on fire? Because the gods wills it. Okay, the fire's not stopping him. What do you think the gun will? I hate this movie. This is awesome. Take the wheel. Oh, oh he's going to Jaws this. He's absolutely going to pull the Jaws. Please blow up already. Smile, you son of a bitch. Thank 
you. Smoke. <laughs> you got Smoke a light. You got him. Say, say, you got a light. Say it, say it. Oh, he's it's gonna even walk better. Over there and he's gonna light the cigarette off of the fire. Oh my God! Yes, do it. No, he's using the arm. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> Oh my <laughs> fucking god! Fucking for beautiful. Fucking beautiful. For those that can't watch this point, this cop has no lighter for a cigarette, so he goes up and he picks up the flaming severed arm of the corpse of the zombie cop and lights it with it. Thank you, movie! Oh my god. It's like they, I always say, you can have a shit movie with a great ending is a great movie. By god. <laughs> no! 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 That was not a great ending. But that was the ending this movie deserved. Yes. Oh my god. I love this movie. And now, back to the episode. All right. Well, uh, yeah, you just heard us watching Maniac Cop 3. Um, watching, I hope it was a... Watching? More like experiencing. Experiencing, yes. That was that was a movie. But to lead off with some uh, final thoughts on this, this gym, I'm going to reluctantly pass this over to Tom, but I'm excited to hear what he has to say about this turd in the wind. Okay, um, watching this movie reminded me of an episode of Cold Jack the Night Stalker. It's a 1970s uh, zero-budget TV show starring the dad from A Christmas Story. Uh, anyways, it, the episode's called The Zombie, where a voodoo priestess resurrects her dead grandson to get revenge on the mafia. And the whole time we were watching this movie, I was thinking that was a half an hour episode from a 1970s TV show that no one watched and barely got two seasons. And it was still a hell of a lot better than this hour and a half long drudgery. This movie was bullshit. So you liked it. As much as I like getting punched <laughs> in the face. No, I liked it as much as standing in line for the post office only to get two people away and have them say, we're closed. We can't accept any more customers because this movie went nowhere. Nothing of consequence happened. The first half hour of the movie was just the maniac cop walking to the plot. That's it. And once he got there, he... Actually, you could argue that he never actually got there. <laughs> I amend I my... Didn't mean to, I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to step on your toes, but I'm just like, he was walking, but it's clear he... I don't think he actually arrived at his destination. At least not the one he was thinking he was going to. The GPS pointed him to a location. He's like, this is close enough. Yeah, the dot says it's over there, but I'm over here. There's no way I can get there. I'm fine parking here. I don't want to steal all of the outrage for this film, but I did notice that this felt like your standard early 90s righteousness porn where, you know, you're kind of rooting for the bad guy because, you know, those evil, greedy hospital types and assholes and those, you know, fake news reporters and people who don't like cops getting their comeuppance. Yeah, righteous fury. Kill them, those people that annoy us. I'm surprised he didn't kill any hookers or drug addicts along the way. He had some opportunities. There was an entire room of drug addicts and he didn't kill them. He let them go. He said, have fun, you guys. Oh my God, George Bush's era of America sucked. Uh, there was no motivation, no plot, no, nothing that connected anything. Just waiting for something to happen, and that's it. With the exception of the last 10 minutes of the movie, there was no point to this film. And I hate films that waste my time. I absolutely hate this. I have a lot more thoughts, and I could give them all, but I want Dan's thoughts. Dan. Tell me what you thought of this movie. I've never seen so much crammed into a movie that did nothing. It went nowhere, made no sense. 
I don't know. This was like watching a porn movie without the sex scenes. Like at least in porn, I get boobs. <laughs> It's That's like, an apt, apt, yeah, it's apt like, description. Like, like the plot, the plot in a porn movie doesn't need to make sense because I'm not watching it for the plot. Mm-hmm. Okay, but this movie, like, there's no gratuitous sex or there's not even that much gratuitous violence to make it seem like okay. Well, this movie's just like not porn, porn, but like it's gun porn or it's uh, you murder know, porn, murder uh, porn or whatever. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not. It, to me, it just like the action scenes are cool. I thought for a small budget film, they were well shot, but there's no point to them. Mm-hmm. Now, I don't know. Maybe it's because we started at Maniac Cop 3 and maybe we need to watch 1 and 2 for it all to make sense. I don't know. You know, it's, I guess it's like starting the MCU at the Avengers and not watching the other connected movies. But, you know. But do you need to start with, like, Friday the 13th Part 1 to get Friday the 13th Part 7? No, because they do a pretty good job of recapping the other Friday the 13th movies when you watch a movie. But, I don't know, just, this movie was an experience, that's for sure, but it was not a great film. It's not worse than Pathfinder, and I did say my expectations, I thought that this would have a good chance of knocking Pathfinder off its perch of being the worst movie we've ever seen. It's... Not Pathfinder, because at least something happens in this film. So, mm-hmm. but what happens in this film makes no sense and has no point and has no weight and there are no stakes. And I'm still trying to figure out what the hell happened. Mm-hmm. Like, who was the maniac cop trying to kill? The drug lords, the other cops, the hospital workers? Yes. I didn't understand the maniac cop's motivation. And then he he, he takes the comatose chick and he's like, oh, I'm going to make her my bride. That came out of nowhere. Yeah. Thanks. But I'm going to keep ranting and my throat hurts. So I'm going to let Josh take over for a minute because we all know Josh loved this film and I can't wait to hear his counter opinion. (laughs) It was his Citizen Kane. Yes. Okay. Well, for one, I'm going to go ahead and start. You guys are wrong. You just don't understand it. That's all it is. You just don't (laughs) understand the film. What this move, this movie wasn't about the detective. It wasn't about the, this was a romantic comedy. Because the entire purpose of this movie was this guy trying to impress this girl so that she would marry him. Oh, but yeah. This, de- end, this definitely had some when Harry met Sally vibes to it. And the only the thing, in, what it ended up as is she was rejected at the end and he went a little crazy. That's, that's all this movie was. It was just it was a romantic movie about an undead cop and a comatose woman. You mean while you were sleeping? Yeah. Only with a HBO budget, so sit down, guys. I mean, come on. This this movie was fantastic. I don't know what your issues are. No, this movie was terrible. But um, okay, I, I will give this movie this. It's better. It's it's actually well produced. Asterisk, well produced. It's like I, I mean, when we started watching the movie, I was expecting something like Sharknado quality production values. Shark, mm-hmm. you know, like those Atlantic Rim type movies with acting. The schlock shit you see on Sci Fi Channel. You like the Transmorphers? Yes. Yeah. I got some like half decent acting. I thought that the main guy did a pretty good job of acting for what he did. You know, it's one of those things like we recognize all these actors. Like we didn't know what they were from, but we recognize them. I thought the acting was half decent. I thought the production was pretty good. The story did nothing. Like, yeah. you guys are right. Seriously, it's like you could tell that they turned in a 51 minute movie and they're like, dude, we need like 40 more minutes. So it's like the first 20 minutes is literally the maniac cop walking. And I want to call it exposition, but I think that would be an insult to the word exposition. Mm -hmm. But um, it had its moments like it was slow. It was one of those things. It was so it was slow and it was slow, but it wasn't so slow that it made the hour and a half movie feel like three hours. Going back to like Green Mile or Wimbledon, and I'm obviously not putting Wimbledon on the same plane as Green Mile, but we were watching those movies and I remember we'd get like not even halfway into the movie, but like 30 or 40 minutes into it. We're like, oh my God, we're 40 minutes into this one. It's like, when we got 40 minutes into this movie, we were more than halfway done. And we'll be like, oh damn, this is trucking along. So mm-hmm. it's paced okay for the length it is. I think if they tried to shove any more into it, it would have been way too much. When we were watching it, we're like, we have like 30 minutes left. What are they going to do for the next 30 minutes? Yeah. But this movie knew what it was and it played into that. It's funny because every time that we was watching something, and I don't know if it's going to make it into the play section or not, like Tom, perfect example. It's like, why isn't he wearing uh, ear protection when they were in the shooting range? 
Mm-hmm. And then it's like, boom, they mentioned it. It's like, oh, because he likes the sound of guns. It's a stupid excuse, but it's aware enough of itself to know it's like, then maybe we should acknowledge that. And that happens several times. I don't know how many times Tom picked up on the dialogue or picked up on the next scene watching this. Like, what's she going to do? And then she pulls out a flashlight, you know? So, yeah, it's, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean the movie's clever. If I'm calling the beats out, like 10 seconds before they even meet him. I'm just saying the movie was aware of itself. But I liked this movie. I will never watch it again, but I liked this movie. Um, I like this movie in that uh, Scooby-Doo meme where it starts with like Velma and it pans over all of their faces and they're horrified. And then it pans over to like Fred and he's just smiling. And then the words, that's my fetish appears over his face. I enjoyed the hell watching this movie with you guys because, (laughs) I don't know, just like the pain in your voices as we were watching this was awesome. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I mean, like I said, (laughs) I'm definitely glad I watched it with you guys as opposed to trying to like watch this by myself because then I would be infuriated. But yeah, I would have stopped about minute or excuse me, not minute, hour 40 of the hospital because my God. Talk about a movie stopping dead in its tracks. Once it got to the hospital, nothing happened. I am definitely curious about Maniac Cop 1 and 2, but I don't know if I'm so curious enough to go watch them, but I really hope that they come back up on a future list. We'll find a way, if only, to... to f- yeah, well, we, we need to do a... The, we need to finish the trilogy. We need to finish the Maniac Cop trilogy, and I would love to finish those, but oh my god, this movie, it's like, there was that one scene that I thought was great, where there was this punk just mouthing off to the maniac cop. And you can't see the guy's face at all. Yeah. And he's just like mouthing off to him. And then just the maniac cop grabs him, throws him into the air, and then just like fucking bullet storms him. I'm just yeah. like, that was awesome. Yeah, that reminded me of the scene from Hard Ticket to Hawaii where they just throw up the sex doll and blow it up with a rocket launcher. It's like, there's no need for this. It's like, what can I say? It's the only way I can hit a moving target. Yeah. Oh, and then the, oh, the last fucking car chase scene. Oh, that was just majesty in cinema. I wouldn't say that redeemed the movie. The very final, well, the second to very final note where he lights his cigarette with the burning corpse arm of the maniac cop. That, that almost redeemed the whole movie. It's like, which one of you guys said that's the ending this movie deserved? That was the cherry on the top for this movie for me. Because it's like, let's just have him chase the Ecto-1 and start punching cars. Okay. (laughs) Oh, he's on fire the whole time, too. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. (laughs) Yeah. That whole last sequence felt like it was like, hey, we got $3,000 left in the budget. And it's not like cell phone minutes. They're not rolling over. So we got to use it. You're like, okay. What can we do? Set him on fire. I, yeah, I just want to add to like that final um, driving sequence. Did it also look like they had the stunt man driving the car while on fire? Oh yeah, they don't have the budget for CG in the ninety in ninety three for this movie. So yeah, no. Or OSHA, I should note. I'm pretty sure that broke a few rules. Like we're going to need you to drive this car wildly through like what is probably actually LA traffic. You're also going to be on fire, Bob. Action! Whoosh! Yeah, that I still love. That. One of my favorite scenes in this movie was when they're in the car, like they're in the back seat of the ambulance. Like we were talking about, like this doesn't feel like this movie has any closure yet, and we still have 12 minutes left. And then suddenly <laughs> the window gets a little brighter and then you see the maniac cop reaching out his hand on fire. I'm just like, okay, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, this, yeah. It was dumb. It made no sense, but it was right. It was absolutely right. Yeah. It just it's like, yeah. I always say that a bad movie with a good ending can make a great movie. I would say that this was a terrible movie with a good ending made a mediocre movie. If it just ended on him lighting the cigarette, it would have been fine. But then they did that sequel hook thing where the maniac. Yeah, that would if they would have swapped the scenes, maybe. But no, I agree. They should have ended it with him lighting the cigarette. I'm pissed off that they wasted the female cop character because they they made it seem like they were going to try to save her. She had that moment where she woke up. She had the weird dream sequence. And was it could they not afford her anymore? Did she have other obligations? So all they had was like her under a sheet the whole time? Because what's the point of that then? 
What was the point of him watching over her and doing anything where they were going to just unceremoniously let her die so they can have this weird Bride of Frankenstein voodoo thing that Maniac Cop didn't even let the voodoo guy finish? He, also, he's the one that caused that problem. He's the one that burned things up. It also came out of nowhere. Like yeah. there, there was nothing in the movie that even remotely hinted that that's what Maniac Cop's motivations were. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, he he he's lonely and he wants a bride or something like that. Like, like there was nothing even remotely hinting to that, except for that little dream sequence that what's her name had, where he was the groom. But yeah. why Dan, he Dan Dan Dan. The plot only works if you don't overthink it. They need to think about the plot a little bit when they're making the movie, though. Yeah. They only had an hour and a half. I mean, come on. You don't need to overthink it, but you need to think about it. Yeah. You got to have the maniac cop walking across L.A. That's at least a 30 year movie. And then you got to have Rorschach doing drugs in a pharmacy. Which was brilliant, Uh, by the way. That was hilarious. Jackie Earl Haley was magnificent in this movie. Yes. Oh, it's honestly, it felt like they were making a procedural cop drama for they they took an unused script for a procedural cop drama in the mid 70s mm-hmm. they forgot about it dusted it off and they're like they shoehorned in the maniac cop as best they could yeah or they took the Coltac the night stalker episode and just tried to stretch it out for an hour and a half uh, they didn't even give anyone motivation the main cop's motivation the guy we were following what was his motivation just watching over the female cop and trying to bang the nurse and then Maniac Cop was trying to do his own thing. There was no cross purposes. There was no conflict between the two of them. There was no point at which you thought their storylines would meet and there would be an epic struggle or anything like that. Oh, yeah. It's like they weren't even aware of each other until like the last five, ten minutes of the movie. Yeah. There was that scene after the chick wakes up from the nightmare and Maniac Cop is right behind him. You think he's going to kill him, but he doesn't. He just slinks back into the shadows because apparently he also has magic teleporting powers it took him a half hour to get to the hospital but he's able to jump across town in seconds to kill other people that have no bearing on the plot at that moment i'm a little upset at this movie i'm not i love this movie it's just so much of it made so little sense Mm -hmm. like just everything comes out of nowhere in this movie with no build no expectations no hinting that this might be what the issue is Nothing, just... Mm -hmm. I would like to think that watching Maniac Cop 1 and 2 would give some insight on these (laughs) characters, but I don't think that the writers were that smart. No. Yeah, it's like I said, I like this movie, but I'll never watch it again. No. Which brings me to my next... It's worth watching once with your friends just to hear their reactions to it. And that's what brings me to my next question for both of you. How does this stack up against Hard Ticket to Hawaii? I l- thought Hard Ticket to Hawaii was a worse movie, but I will watch that one again. Yeah, that <laughs> one's got boobs in it. That one was worse, but I liked it better. <laughs> what what made you like it better? And not just the boobs. We all like the boobs in that movie. But okay, what- the ridiculous uh, Anaconda sub story arc. Mm-hmm. Um, the one that the, the uh, blow up doll with the frisbee. rocket launcher. That's pretty awesome. And- Yep, the blow up doll with the oh, rocket launcher, the razor blade frisbee. Razor yep, blade. That's a razor frisbee. I just said that. Yeah. Um, and just some of the dialogue was just, "Hey, Colleen, nice ass, dude." <laughs> seriously, just that's one of those movies where it's so bad it's amazing. And from my end, I also think it's better because you can track where it's all going. You're not quite sure what's going to happen when they get there, but you know they're going somewhere. Yeah. Also, the plot to Hard Ticket to Hawaii is stupid, but it makes sense. Like, you can follow one. it. You can follow it. You know what the characters' motivations are. You know what they're like. So when things happen and unfold in the movie, even if they're predictable and you see them coming a mile away, it makes sense. Because, again, it has a plot. Whereas this movie, I still don't know what, what was the point of any of this. Decent cinematography and stuff and yeah. spots, though. I'll give it like, that much. Like, that shootout at the hospital was fucking pointless. Yeah. Dude, dude but that one scene where they're like, the, the three drug dealers are at the end of the hallway, and they look down the hallway, and they just see a body <laughs> covered, and it slowly starts coming through them. And then it's the detective dude shooting them through the 
sheets. Then he pops off and just starts doing it, and he dances across the thing. Oh man, oh, man. that that was totally dumb- pointless, but amazing. The movie needed more of that. Yes, yes, that was the most pointless and overly cheesy scene, but that was so much fun. And this isn't a movie where it had the maniac cop basically shock paddle some dude to death. He doesn't just shock paddle the face. He pushes down so hard and is able to lift him in the air. Like freaking oh, incredible Hulk. the dude with the x-ray. Yeah, this movie, just like, we're not going to give you the play-by-play. But this movie is ridiculous. It is amazing. Watch well, the it. parts that are ridiculous, they're amazing. When it's moving, it's moving. When it's when it's yeah but it's so short it's gonna be over and you're gonna be like okay well that wasn't that big of a time waste yeah whereas like wimbledon was like two hour movie that felt like six yeah yeah i think the whole time we were watching all of us were agreeing that as bad as this movie was it's not the worst movie we've seen on this podcast i mean it's in that tier of bad movies but it's not the worst oh yeah it's, it's it's top five but it's, you know, it's it's not the worst. No, it's bottom of the top five, for yeah. sure. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Uh, so, Josh, would you recommend... No, no, don't. No, I'm done with that bit. That, that was a season one Tom thing. Yes. We killed that like we killed the quiz. Slow and painfully. Not soon enough. <laughs> and not soon <laughs> enough. But uh, I guess that does it for tonight's show. As always, you can find us at firepitpodcast.com. Uh, You can find links to Spotify, iTunes, Google, Amazon, wherever you want to listen to your podcast, you can find a link there. Regular episodes are, as always, or whenever we can, released Tuesdays at 6 p.m. We do ask that you like our episode on whatever platform you are, like Podbean will show us when you like it. iTunes will definitely see, we'll see ratings, we'll see written reviews. Like right now, if you Google Fire Pit Podcast, we're number one on the uh, search results, comma, however that golf fire pit podcast gets the sidebar because it has more ratings like we have like 10 he has like 300 so i'm a little jealous of that one we have more episodes and i'm gonna go ahead and just say we're better produced but we never listen to an episode so like and subscribe leave a review we will read it on the air so we appreciate anything if you just stay listening to us that's fine we appreciate you listening but seriously review us so we can beat that golf podcast Yes, yes we need to be number one on the search results Yes. We need the sidebar. And be sure to join our Discord channel as well. The link in the episode's description at discord.me forward slash firepit. Uh, you'll get notifications of new episodes, and even better, you can engage in discussions with other fans of the show, including us. Well, we're not just fans of the show. We're the hosts. But uh, <laughs> longtime fans like Rob and Danielle and Tarek Thorne, and you know they're in the Discord. They're always talking about the latest episode when it drops and having discussions. And they're lonely. They need more friends. So join the Discord and uh, join in on the discussion. And if you want to discuss things a little more privately, though, you can... Always email us at curtaincallentertainmentinc at gmail.com. I think some sexy voiced individual mentions that in the interspersal segment. While you're at it, please be sure to like our page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at FirePitCCE. Both are linked in this episode's description as well. And if, and if you can think of any other social media platforms that you'd like to see more of us on, Etsy... Um, I only think fans, only fans, not it on that one. So yeah, give us any recommendations and we'll see what we can do about it. And I would like to shout out Demon Dan for joining us on this viewing today. Always appreciate you joining us today, Demon Dan. So thank you. Don't ask me to do the voice. I can't do it tonight. I can't. Amazing as always. You're just doing great job, Demon Dan. Thank you. That was a joke because, you know, you clearly don't sound like Dan right now. Simpsons meme. That's the joke. <laughs> Fuck you guys. <laughs> I'm so tired. Dan's not feeling well tonight, so thank you for <laughs> coming up, Dan. Yeah. And if you, if you haven't noticed the difference between beginning of episode Dan and later in the episode Dan, this movie's done a number on him. Yeah. And uh, I owe my buddy Nick a shout out too for helping me out with that thing yesterday. I do genuinely appreciate it, and let's never talk about it again. I would like to shout out uh, Peggy, the OG friend of the channel, uh, always listening, always providing the feedback and encouragement. It's always uh, grateful. Uh, I would also like to shout out Mucinex and ask them to be a sponsor because I've been using a lot of it over the last couple of days, and uh, it'd be great if I didn't have to pay for it. So uh, shout out to Mucinex because it 
it helps me sleep. Uh, and also a shout out to our recording software, uh, Zencaster. Well, it's not ours, but we use it and we don't pay for it and they don't pay us, but man, it's, it's, it's pretty awesome. Um, I think our editor is going to have his hands full because of how I sound tonight, but um, at least uh, we won't lose the podcast. So shout out to Zencaster there. And uh, also a uh, special shout out to my wife. Uh, our anniversary is coming up in a couple of weeks and uh, I don't want to risk getting too busy that I forget to shout it out on the podcast. So I've just reminded myself I'm going to shout it out on every episode leading up to our anniversary. Happy anniversary. Aww. And a uh, belated special shout out to uh, our distinguished director, uh, Josh. Uh, it was his birthday a couple of weeks ago, but uh, we were busy with, well, birthday parties and um, weddings and funerals and bar mitzvahs and uh, October was a very busy month. So we didn't really get a chance to shout out his birthday, but um, it's always important to remind someone when they're getting older. And uh, so happy birthday, Josh. I know it's a little belated and I know it's a few weeks behind, but uh, you know, it's awesome celebrating it's them with you. We, we did get to celebrate it with you though. We were, we, know, we had a big we, party at your house. So yeah. Yeah, and then somebody had to get married on my birthday weekend, so that definitely kind of overshadowed me turning, yeah. you know, 38, yeah. so. <laughs> well, just think, his anniversary is now forever linked with your birthday. Yep, yep. So it's like, he, in the back of his mind, he's always going to be reminded, happy anniversary, honey, and the voice in his back, and happy birthday, Josh. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. So there you go. Silver well, Thank you, guys. Well, now i got to follow that shout-out. I will shout-out to some of our latest and newest and newest and latest followers. Uh, on Facebook, I'd like to shout-out Shelby. And on Podbean, I would like to give a very special shout-out to Mag Z, who is our 100th follower on Podbean. At least at the time of this recording. There might be someone else. Um, well, actually, if you're the 100th, you'll always remain the 100th. So, Mag Z, congratulations and thank you on reaching the 100 milestone. To think, about a year ago this time, we were lucky that we were listening to our own podcast. And here we are with 100 people. So, thank you very much, Mag Z, and everyone else, both on Facebook and Podbean, who tune in every week or whenever they can to listen to us or just like us being on their Facebook feed to see what we post, your thoughts, whatever the case, and just generally helping to keep the fire pits burning. And in terms of tools and software, Dan mentioned me having to edit him through all of this, and I couldn't do it without Audacity. Audacity is the program I use every week and weekend and sometimes more to stitch these episodes together, make us sound as fantastically sexy as we think we sound to ourselves. Audacity is free software, so I'm not paying a dime to use it, and they're not paying a penny for us to say anything about them, but again, we, I've been using them for Going into two years now, they haven't done wrong by me. I'm sure they'll do right by you. And also one final shout out to Podbean real quick for making us their featured podcast a few weeks ago. I know that it's done now and, you know, there's no obligation to it, but it was still really cool of them. It really helped us out and really get the word out about the podcast and give us that boost. And it's it cannot be I can't see how much we appreciate it and how much fun we've had being hosted on their site. So thank you very much, Podbean. So um, I guess now we have license to go on to our next uh, movie, guys, right? It's looking like it's going to be a killer, too. Yeah, I hope I got a license for it. Yeah, I know. Uh, that'd be awesome to just, you know, be able to kill anybody and be legal. Yes. Uh, before we do, I think you need to sober up. You've been hitting those uh, martinis hard. Well, that's not true, though. He, he gets them shaken, not stirred. So they're not as you know, heavy. Yeah. Okay. Well, as, as long as we keep it secret, you know? Yeah. You keep yeah, it on. I just, I, I need that license to kill because I have a list. Next week, we're watching license to kill. <laughs> <laughs> we are following Robert Davey from this movie to license to kill. So be sure to tune in next week. And, uh, we're going to go to our first James Bond movie as a, as the fire pit podcast. Ooh, Ooh and yeah. a Timothy Dalton one at that. Yeah. I am, I am very much looking forward to next week's episode. 
But uh, thank you guys for listening. And as always, I've been Josh. I've been Dan. And I've been Tom. Thanks for listening. This has been a production of Curtain Call Entertainment, LLC. Stay safe out there. job getting him in the case guys <laughs> oh my god oh my god it worked just like demon dan said okay now all we got to pull a lever and set him on fire tom pull the lever rest in peace demon dan you sacrificed yourself so that we could live pull the goddamn lever pulling the lever by the way josh do you, you want to add some uh thoughts final words before i you know i mean he was we, we didn't know oh my god that. pull the goddamn lever I still don't understand how all that freaking worked. I mean, how did we get out of that unscathed? I know, right? Unscathed! I have a huge scar on my leg. I walk with a limp. My right hand is now completely numb. Yeah, but we're unscathed. And it's all thanks to Demon Dan. So I think before we engage this, we really need to say some nice things about Oh him. my god, really that's, it, that's it. This is the last time with you guys. Every single time we get involved in something like this, something like this happens. All you guys want to do is we go over here and you guys possess me with a demon and then we got to summon another demon and then we lose the guy's Chipotle and then we get fired from that job and we... Plan B. Run! All right, ass hats. I got a corner. Tom, will you please drop the gas can? Gas can? I choose you. No, Josh. Light it. All right. Barbecue's lit. You're suspended with pay. I'm showing you without pay. <laughs> You hear that poor undead fool about to get smashed under a full torse? <laughs> yes, that's me. And you're probably wondering how I got here.